Um, yeah, no. Uh, I'll, okay, well, I'll just start off really quickly. Um, so just welcome everyone to our Jamil Clinic seminar series, which we have every Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern. And uh, it's really just to showcase the work that the PIs at Jamil Clinic are doing. And so today we're welcoming uh, Dr. Colin Stoltz, who um, besides being a PI at the Jamil Clinic, um, Colin is a Nina T. and Ro uh, Robert H. Rubin Professor um, in Medical Engineering and Science, a Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, and he's also a faculty member in the Harvard-MIT Division of Health Sciences and Technology. And he is also a practicing cardiologist at the MGH. And currently his research group is focused on the development of machine learning tools that can guide clinical decision making. And uh, as always, we're going to save some time at the end for questions, and um, you can ask your questions in the Zoom chat, and we'll have Colin respond to them at the very end. And um, I'll let Colin take it from here, and I'm sure we're all very excited to hear about the work that he's doing um, in cardiovascular data science for personalized medicine. Thank you very much, Alex, and thank you, Ignacio, for, for having me talk about the work, some of the work that's going on in my group. Um, so. Um, my, my goal today is to give a realistic impression of where, what my view is, of where artificial intelligence, and I'm going to focus on machine learning, is in, in medicine, highlighting the promise, I think, of these methods, and at the same time, though, adding a little bit of, uh, what's the right terminology here, um, a little bit of apprehension on, on the part of practitioners and on patients themselves and, and, and in an event, in an, in an effort to give a realistic view of where we are and what obstacles need to be overcome. So typically when I give these talks, I begin with just a simple um, a statement as to what medicine is in 2022. And, and this paradigm has existed for centuries. Medicine at its core involves two individuals. There is the patient and there is a healthcare provider. And the patient is a generator of information. They, they um, generate information via what they convey to the healthcare provider in words. There are laboratory studies that are acquired from blood draws and x-rays and studs, but such, but the, the source is all um, from the patient. And the healthcare provider has to use these data to decide what medications and procedures will make the patient either live longer or make them not have pain. And, and this paradigm is true now. It was true 100 years ago. What makes it very different now is that the types of data that, it, that are generated from the patient are much more complex. These are complex pieces of data, different levels of resolution. So we have, in addition to the words uttered by the, by the patient, there are electrocardiographic data, and there are many samples here, um, typically an electrocardiogram in 5,000 hertz to 60,000 numbers that the, that the healthcare provider has to process. There are images. Um, this is a representative cardiac ultrasound, essentially videos of the heart that the healthcare provider has to process. There are CT scans, MRI scans. There are interpretations of these data by the radiologist. These are another set of words that the healthcare provider has to parse. And then there are data from the electronic health record. Now, because the human brain is as limited as it is, the healthcare provider can't look at every single pixel in every image. They have to do their own feature um, abstraction or extraction, I should say. So looking at the image, the, the healthcare provider says, well, I know that this area corresponds to the mitral valve. It's an area that runs into problems. I'm gonna focus my view on this valve. And then I'm gonna look at the chambers that I, that I, I recognize and that I know play a role in, in human disease. And I'm gonna use that to give my interpretation of this. And that's true with all of these data. All of the 60,000 numbers that goes into an electrocardiogram can't be processed by the human brain. So we have to focus on those areas that we a priori um, believe are, are, are have high information content that are the most informative. Now, the promise of artificial intelligence, and again, my talk is really focused on machine learning, is that computers don't have to do this. They can synthesize data from diverse sources 
at high resolution to discover complex relationships between different types of data. So, the, so a machine can look at actually every pixel in every image. It can look at all of the words uttered by the radiologist. It can look at all of the 60,000 numbers in the electrocardiogram, everything from the electronic health record to find new relationships that would have been hidden because the human has to make, has to do this abstraction of all of this wealth of data to make useful clinical statements. And um, ML, can in, in principle yield algorithms that can combine these multimodal data, data corresponding to different modalities, numbers in an electrocardiogram, pixels in an image, words on a page, yielding new insights. So, so if, if you look in the computer science literature and even some of the emerging clinical literature, you will find machine learning praised by a number of different um, individuals in, in the sense that it is the panacea for all of man's ills in, in the healthcare space and, and, and elsewhere. However, if you go into the trenches, and by that I mean in, into the hospital wards and the outpatient clinics and the inpatient service, and you ask the people that are responsible for treating patients, and moreover, if you ask the patients themselves about this, they actually are not aware of these methods, nor are they aware of these uh, particular um, insights. So consequently, while the importance of machine learning in the healthcare sphere is recognized, particularly in the literature, it has not been embraced by the cardiovascular community. And why is that? Well, when we look at these models, at least the ones that form the majority of the uh, literature, the published literature in 2022, they all have a particular, uh, not all, but there's a particular form of these models that have um, become quite, quite popular. So if I were to take one of these models that integrates all of these diverse sources of information and I were to open the hood and look inside, what do I see? And this is my a representation of an artificial neural network. These are complex models, many connections, many tunable parameters. And these things are quite complex and, and complex in the sense that even those who design them and, and, uh, and build them cannot really articulate what they have learned when they are trained for a particular task. These models are mysterious and that is to be contrasted with the simple models that are typically used in the clinical sphere. Um, typically, um, computational models that are used by clinicians, um, we take these abstracted features, and I sort of looked at, uh, alluded to this earlier. Um, we do feature extraction. We put them in a simple model, models such as linear or logistic regression, each of the weights. There are weights associated with each of the parameter parameters, and we can understand in a sense what the model has learned about the relative importance of each of these different parameters, where each of these parameters we understand. So for example, Framingham risk score may look at a systolic blood pressure, look at your, uh, um, or things like the Framingham risk score, look at your, your sex or whether you have diabetes or not. We know these things are in some sense causally related or there's good data to suggest that these things are causally related to the outcome and we can look at their different ways. You can't do this with these types of models. So, so these deep artificial networks are complex, contain many modifiable parameters and are very different, very difficult to understand. So it's quite distinct the, uh, from the types of models that have gained notoriety in, in clinical medicine. And I think that is one, one, um, one cause for skepticism, but I'll, I'll get to the more important uh, causes and the more important um, obstacles in subsequently. The point here being that looking at the literature, there are two populations of individuals. So there's a computer science community who are, um, um, will herald the, the, uh, these approaches and their success. And there are conferences built around these methods and, and, um, and showing their success in a variety of different um, frameworks. But in the clinical community, there is certainly some um, enthusiasm. And as a clinician myself, I am one of those enthusiastic individuals. However, there's a bit of trepidation um, in, in principle, or I say because of, the, of the, um, how opaque these models are. Now, from the standpoint of the patient and the clinician, remember this, this very essential um, interaction, 
patient generates information, gives it to the clinician, and the clinician has to use that to make decisions about what's best for the patient. And moreover, has to be able to communicate to the patient in a way that the patient will understand why they have arrived at a particular decision. It leads to another avenue that is problematic for the acceptance of these models. So when a healthcare provider is given the um, result of a, of a particular model, there are two questions that um, go through their, their mind. So one, what precisely has the model learned? And is the model consistent with what I know about human disease? Now, one way to rephrase that is that these models are typically trained on some data, and then there's held out data um, that the model is tested on. So you train it on some data, and you get some new data, and you evaluate the performance of the model. And that data set that you evaluate, the performance might be large, but nevertheless, it is quite finite. And and medical knowledge has existed for several centuries. I think the first medical school in the US was late 1700s. And so there's a corpus of knowledge of, in, um, in medicine that you'd like to be able to understand whether the model is in some way consistent with that, with that body, of, body of knowledge, because it would give the healthcare provider more confidence that the model is going to be useful in perpetuity, rather than saying that the model is just useful, you know, for some finite, for some, from, some, from some finite data set. And this is particularly important in instances where the physiology and the disease process is well understood. Um, there are diseases in which the um, knowledge I don't think is debatable because it has remained clear over, um, over a century. Um, and in those instances, I think these, these considerations are particularly important. More importantly, um, the, the other question that arguably is, is more important is even though the overall performance of the model is good, will it work for the specific patient that is standing in front of the healthcare provider? So the performance metrics that these models are typically evaluated on are statistical measures of success. What's the overall accuracy? What's, its, what's the model's discriminatory ability or its predictive ability? And that's that those numbers are garnered by looking at average results of a relatively heterogeneous population. But if a model does not have 100% accuracy, and I have yet to find a model that does so in, in the clinical sphere, um, uh, then, then understanding when the model will fail is important. What is the particular failure mode of the model? Um, and because these are high stakes decisions and to make it concrete, if, you, um, if I see a patient and a model says that this patient is at low risk of, of having um, an adverse cardiovascular event, uh, dying in, in, in a year, and I, believe that model and I don't administer an intervention or I don't recommend an intervention that I think will prolong that, that would prolong that patient's life, then I've missed an opportunity or we as a, as a, as a community have missed an opportunity to save the life. And um, so in light of that, failure modes is very, very important. So I want to, because I know that this is sort of an abbreviated talk, I've been admonished by, by, by and, and happily admonished by Ignacio and, 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 and others that this is sort of a short 30 to 45 minute talk. So I'm just gonna keep this, keep this brief. And I wanna talk a little bit about evaluation of these models in this space and, some of, and highlight some of the work that, um, that we have done in this, in this sphere. So model explanation. So now just to give some background, what is an explanation? So there have been methods that have been described to understand what a deep, learning model has learned that you would like to convey to the healthcare provider to give them assurance that the model is acting in a rational fashion. And if you, know, if you look at these complex um, neural networks, they take a series of inputs. This is sort of a model, a schematic that takes heart rate, pulse rate, weight, um, um, I'm sorry, blood pressure, a, a variety of different variables, maps them into a neural network, develop what we call an abstract representation of the data and use that and outputs that in some clinically meaningful fashion. And so if you were to ask the computer scientists, and this is a, a famous one, 
Um, it's always one of the disadvantages of giving talks by by Zoom. I, I can't sort of get people's reactions when they see that this is um, um, Dr. Professor Turing. He's a good one, um, Colin, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> He's a good one, yeah. And if you were to ask the computer scientist to explain what this meant, you would you would find you know the following you may find the following verbiage by by looking at activations of the hidden layers looking at saliency maps you can see what and this this these words have significant information content to the computer scientist but the, to the to the clinician it doesn't make a whole lot of sense and so this is where I would typically would give this lecture the person ask what language this is and, and but it's Swahili it's just I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. So it's, it's a language that this particular healthcare provider is not, not familiar with. So, so the question is, um, and there are a number of methods that have been developed in this space and for the sake of completeness, there are you know, graded weighted class activation maps, shapely values, saliency maps and little two before. Now, a lot of these methods tell us what are the features, the input features that are important for the model making a decision. So if there's heart rate, blood pressure, um, um, sex, these methods will say, well, the model really uses sex or is looking at sex for this particular patient in order when it makes a decision. But that, you know, that, is that really an explanation? I guess that's, you know, that's sort of a philosophical, philosophical question. I would argue that in many instances, it is not. And, and moreover, the, the fallacy here is that a lot of these methods cause you to focus on particular areas while the model in principle uses all of the data to make a decision. So if you want to take a step back and think about what is an explanation? What comprises an explanation? It, just in general, but again, the application domain being the clinical domain. So I, I actually, it's a deep question about what is an explanation, and I'm not sure I can answer that, but I can certainly think about what makes an explanation bad. An explanation is a discussion where all participants speak the same language. And explanations so that are intended to be used in a clinical context should be worded in a language that is familiar to the clinician. So case in point, abstracting from clinical medicine, if you have a, a physicist who's trying to explain the Heisenberg uncertainty principle to a Shakespearean scholar, that explanation will be very different than if the um, physicist is trying to explain it to somebody who's had a course in classical mechanics explanations are context dependent. And one has to first establish what is a lexicon of the listener, the person who you want to explain this to before having, uh, before having a, before offering an explanation. So, and, and, and it's been our view or our approach is physiology, the language of physiology is something that clinicians learn in, in medical school. You can explain, um, and so explanations that are grounded in those principles are easy for the clinician to understand and more importantly, easier for the clinician to explain to the patient when they are uh, trying to um, describe why they are making decisions. And if they're using a model to do so, they can, they, can, they can go back to the language of physiology to at least explain in a meaningful way why, the, why they're doing making particular interventions for patients. So, so in this vein, I'll talk quickly about one, one piece of work we did in this, in this space, explainable machine learning for clinical decision-making. So our approach has been as follows. So we have a, a group of models. We initially call them knowledge guided networks. I think the, the name has changed a little bit since then, but we have inputs to the model and we wanna predict something. So we may take uh, just relying on the same inputs I talked about previously, age, blood pressure, diabetes, and we want to predict whether someone is going to have an adverse cardiovascular event, death or a heart attack or such. And this is a straightforward approach. You could take many, a, a few off the shelf um, um, methods to do so if you have enough data. Now, the difference here is that we first ask the user to specify concepts that they are familiar with. And these concepts, uh, again, are grounded in physiology. And the model, instead of just outputting the prediction, it also output, outputs a rationale, an explanation that is grounded in the, in the user-specified concepts. So um, to make this um, concrete in an application that we, we had, we have inputs, we have the electrocardiogram, patient demographics, um, and we, the, 
domain concepts that we focus on, again, are physiologic concepts and concepts familiar in cardiovascular physiology, things such as the cardiac output, the systemic vascular resistance, I have cardiac output here twice, it shouldn't be, systolic and diastolic times and, and, and so forth. And these concepts appear and they enter into the model in a sense that we are specifying relationships between the concepts and the, and the outcomes. I'll talk a little bit about that um, later. And we were predicting risk of death six months after right heart catheterization. And then we also um, um, output an interpretation. So the problem here is given the patient's ECG demographics um, and they, these patients, a lot of them have heart failure. They undergo a procedure to measure pressures inside of the chest. And then we wanna predict their risk of death six months after they've had this, had this procedure using only these input data I, I, I mentioned. So the model, this is a probabilistic model. It's very straightforward. It has a very simple plate diagram. We have an underlying observed risk. Um, the observables are the outcome. Uh, we have in, these observed features as input. The concepts that I have described are here, listed as I've written here as latent, latent parameters. And then there are these other learnable parameters that dictate the distributions of both the latent concepts and the observed parameters. So you can set this up as a variational um, in, inference problem. And you, you, this tells you how to compute the probabilities and you can find parameters for these, um, these variables that maximize the a posteriori probability, um, a posterior um, distribution, and to get these predictions. So that's just in a, in a mouthful, essentially what the, how the, the inner workings of a model and how this, how this works. So if you take this to um, a data set, and again, we're predicting here death after some index event and a catheterization, this a model learning to predict with supporting evidence has an AUC of 0.74. And if you compare this to just a model, just training the straightforward model inputs and outputs, the patient data, the ECG, the uh, patient demographics and the output, the performance is slightly comparable. It's comparable. They're, they're, you know, they're not statistically uh, different. So this model doesn't care anything about interpretations, doesn't care anything about explanations, the baseline model. It only strives to predict the outcome, learning to predict um, um, with uh, supporting evidence, cares about the outcome and the concepts, explanations and forms of the concepts. And you don't take that much of a hit if you take this other thing into consideration. Here, for those of you who are familiar with some of the um, work in this space, these are um, self-explaining neural networks. These are networks that also try to map the predictions onto different types of explanations. The difference here is in, in the self-explaining neural networks, the concepts are not specified a priori. They're not specified at the outset of the learning procedure. So in other, in, in other, ways, other words, the model is trained, it makes predictions, and then you try to learn the concepts by looking at the training data that explain the predictions. So it's just another approach. And one of the, the in my view, the uh, disadvantages here of this mop, of that approach is that at least in the clinical setting, the concepts that are learned from the training data are not guaranteed to have the same lexicon as the user. So they can be quite difficult to, to gather meaningful explanations to the user. Whereas learning with, uh, with a, whereas LPS, learning to uh, predict with supporting evidence, because it begins at the outset by asking the user what concepts are familiar to you and having that specified in the, in the process is, is the, the explanations are inherently easier to understand. So a few things about this, we can have predictions, we have supporting evidence. In this case, this is, these are data for a particular patient the probability that this patient is going to die in six months is high, and the supporting evidence being that the cardiac output is low, the systemic vascular resistance is high, and these are concepts that make sense to the user. Any cardiologist would understand this as being um, useful data. And moreover, it suggests potential therapeutic interventions. So what drugs can I give to increase the uh, cardiac output? What drugs can I do to reduce the systemic vascular resistance? So one of the key things here is that the concepts not only are understandable to the user, but they're designed in a manner such that they have 
um, clear therapeutic um, um, implications. Also, a, a side um, benefit of this is that you can use this to gauge in some sense the trustworthiness of the model. So if, for example, in um, this, uh, this um, oh, is this here? Well, in one of these examples, and I think this is not what's quite shown here, is that um, in this patient, it was, the risk was predicted um, to be low. But if you look at the cardiac output um, here, this is the cardiac output for this patient. This is the range of normal. It's right on the upper limit of normal. And similarly, oh, I'm sorry, no, this is a, um, not the cardiac output, the systemic vascular resistance. It's on the upper limit of normal. So it's a borderline case. So you can not only look at the prediction, you can look at the supporting evidence and gauge the importance of the supporting evidence in terms of whether it predicts it to be high, low, on the extremes of what's normal. I think that's added information that, that the um, healthcare provider can use in their clinical decision-making. So this is about the explainability here. Our premise being that explainability requires, um, is different for different listeners. The listener has to specify their understanding, the concepts that are familiar to them, and that can be used in the design process to ensure that you have models that, that yield um, 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 easily understood um, insights. So the second part of this is, is the uh, other, other aspect of this. And for this, I'll be, I will be brief because it's um, at half an hour and I do wanna leave time for discussion. So even though the overall performance of the model may be good so that the statistical measures of success are high, will it work for the specific patient you have in, in, in front of you or that I would have in front of me or any healthcare provider would have in front of them. And so I wanna talk a little bit about building trustworthy machine learning models and things that you can use by leveraging again, domain expertise. And this is where it, in, it must entail model building has to happen in, in conjunction or should be informed by the insights of the practitioner, by the healthcare provider. And so this example is deep learning for non-invasively estimating cardiac pressures. And I'm just gonna take a few minutes just to talk a little bit about the problem and set the stage um, before getting into how we make, uh, what is a trustworthy machine learning model or what is our view of this? So um, talking about normal cardiac function, the heart is a pump, takes blood from one area of the body, pumps it out into another area of the body, the right heart. Everybody's got two hearts, a right heart and a left heart. The right heart takes blood that has relatively little oxygen content. And that's depicted here, pumps it to the lungs, gets oxygen, goes to the left heart. The left heart pumps it out to the rest of the body. Essentially, both pieces of this, of this, uh, of, of um, this very bio sophisticated biological device, it's, it's, it's a pump. Heart failure is a very bad disease. And its strict definition is that it is an inability of the heart to provide blood that's commensurate with the body's needs. And heart failure is, is difficult for one of uh, the following reasons. It typically begins with some insult to the heart, whether it's a heart attack, maybe a viral infection. Sometimes we can never find out what the, um, what the insult is. Sometimes people are born with the conditions that lead to this, uh, lead to this insult. But the upshot, being that the insult leads to decreased pumping activity of the heart. The heart's not able to produce enough blood. That's what decreased cardiac output means. The output from the heart is down. The nervous system senses that the heart is not doing its job and it secretes a lot of molecules and, and hormones that cause the heart to work a lot harder. And when the heart works harder, it's trying to produce, uh, increase the cardiac output. But that causes more damage to the heart. As it works, a sick heart that works harder gets more damage. And then there's more myocardial injury, decreased pump performance, decreased cardiac output, and it's a spiraling cycle that ends in death. So symptoms include shortness of breath, fluid retention, fatigue, and the mortality is quite high. So at one year after discharge in some cohorts, uh, mortality is as high as 37% in five years, greater than 50% of patients with heart failure, with heart failure die. And so in, in many respects, the diagnosis for many patients uh, is worse than some forms of cancer. 
So now what is central in the evaluation and the clinical evaluation of patients with heart failure is an assessment of their cardiac pressures. What are the pressures inside of the chest? If the pressures are elevated, they can be treated medically, either with oral drugs or IV drugs, and very elevated pressures that are refractory to medical therapy, they require what we call advanced therapies, um, devices, and in the end, cardiac transplant. Cardiac pressures are, in the gold standard, are measured invasively. So it, this is a procedure where a catheter with a pressure transducer is, goes into a large vessel, either the, typically in the neck, the internal jugular, it can go in through the uh, subclavian in, in the chest or in the leg. And when the catheter is placed into, it goes into this large vessel, it goes into the heart and you can measure pressures in each of the chambers of the heart. And here this is just depicted the catheter with a pressure transducer on the end going through different chambers. And as it goes through different chambers, you can measure pressures in different, different areas, the right ventricle, the pulmonary artery, estimates of the left atrial pressure and so forth. So when patients get admitted with heart failure, and here, this plot, this is time on the x-axis. This is, these are the pressures, and it's been the pressures on the y-axis. Their pressures are quite high. And many of these patients, when they're admitted, they get this invasive procedure to quantify how high the pressures are. In some instances, this needs to be done. And the therapy here is reactive. Once the pressures are high, we give medications that can reduce the pressures and, it, and improve the cardiac output. But if you had a, a, a lens into the patient's heart and you could measure their, pre, their pressures way before they presented, they start to rise very early, here three weeks beforehand. Right? And so when we catch them, we're already um, behind the curve because our pressures are high. We've missed an opportunity to, to, um, to intervene earlier on. If we could measure the pressures beforehand, we could take a proactive strategy so that when the pressures are elevated before they get to the point that requires hospitalization and we could, um, we could intervene um, to, pre to prevent a hospitalization. Now, th this is not a new concept. There are invasive devices, cardiomems being one, that are implanted in the pulmonary artery that can measure pressures, but this is an invasive procedure, a device that one walks around with for quite some time. And um, so it, it does entail um, some, some risk. You, wouldn't, you couldn't bring somebody into the hospital every day and do this invasive catheterization. That certainly would be too risky for many, many, many patients. What you'd like to do is leverage signals that are easily obtained at home. If, if there was something that you could easily get at home without having to cannulate the great vessels and measure the pressures, you could find this and uh, find this point in time a lot easier, so a lot faster. So our hypothesis is the electrocardiogram is one such signal. So here's a patient that sort of has a representative uh, leads for an electrocardiogram, but this is old. Now, nowadays, you know, electrocardiograms are quite easy to get um, at home. There are phones and attachments you can add on it to get your electrocardiogram. When giving these, this talk in person, I used to ask how many people had an Apple watch and many people would raise their hand because an Apple watch now, you can record a single lead of an electrocardiogram. And if you could leverage these data to be able to predict these pressures, it performs, I think that's one mechanism for a low-lying fruit to be able to um, um, identify elevated pressures and intervene before, before one is hospitalized. So our goal was to leverage deep learning to develop a non-invasive method for identifying um, these pressures. And we hypothesize that you can do so using deep learning, using the electrocardiogram instead of using an invasive procedure. Now, in many of the slides that I, that I will show subsequent to this, you'll see this term PCWP, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Really, you should just replace this with pressures inside the heart. This is, uh, this is an estimate of a particular pressure for the left atrium, but for the purpose of this discussion, this is really just um, estimating ele elevated pressures in the heart. So if one wanted to do this, 
you take a bunch of patients in which you have the ECG information and you also know what the pressures are. You plug this into some algorithm to try to learn the relationship and then you can use that in, in, in the future. So um, if you, but if, and, and um, the most straightforward way of doing that, even before getting to deep learning is to do what the clinician does. Clinician takes a look at the ECG, you know, with the sampling rate of 500 Hertz, it's about 60,000 numbers in the, in the, in the machine. And you abstract and say, well, I can't look at every single number in the signal. I'm gonna look at particular regions of the signal, the ST segment, what's the heart rate, and try to um, estimate what the pressures are there. So let's say if we did that approach. So if we had, we had a data set of about close to 5,000, 4,850 4, electrocardiograms, and also patients that had co uh, concomitant uh, pressures measured, and we did this feature extraction. What's the heart rate, various intervals, we do what the human mind does, and we put this into a very simple model, a just a regression model, and we trained it to predict the probability that the pressures inside the chest are elevated. Because again, for these patients, we know the answer. We want to train a model that's going to find this relationship. It's a supervised machine learning problem. So we know the answer. We're trying to build, build, this, uh, build this relationship. And the AUC is 0 0.5. So before I mentioned the um, AUC of the learning to predict with, uh, with supporting evidence, and that was about 0 0.74, 0 0.75, I think it was 0.74. And just to be precise in terms of what the AUC measures, the AUC tells us about the discriminatory ability of a model. And the formal definition being in this application, if you have two patients, one has an elevated pressure inside the chest, one has elevated cardiac pressures and the other does not, what's the probability that the model assigns a higher value to the patient that has a higher pressure? It's the ab ability of the model to discriminate between patients that have high pressures and low pressures. So an AUC of 0 0.5 is worthless. It's the worst it can be. It's like flipping a coin. So again, the worst possible AUC is 0 0.5. The best is 1.0. And this works horribly. Extraction, what we do every day in looking at electrocardiograms, those data are not useful for this problem. So then we went to these black box methods. And we developed a deep learning model. The model looks at all of the 60,000 numbers in the ECG develops what we call these abstract feet, um, high level abstractions. And we trained, trained such a model in the same way and we get an AUC of 0 0.69, which is better, but you know, I'm not quite sure that's as good as it can be. And again, I'm, I'm gonna get the, uh, go past this quick because I'm, I'm struggling for time here and um, I wanna get to the main points. So we leveraged the larger data set. We did some pre-training to develop, to get some high level abstractions using a larger set of data and then fine tune that on the data set of interest. And finally, we get an AUC of 0 0.8. So we have a big black box. The overall statistical me uh, measures seem, um, seem good for, this, for the performance of, for this task, estimating the elevated pressures. We demonstrated this on many different um, data sets. We have uh, on different, different cohorts. And we can use the model um, to see how it would perform over the general population. We computed sensitivities and specificities, looked at the positive predictive values, negative predictive values. And the upshot of all of this being that using the um, estimated prevalence of heart failure in patients 60 and above, the negative predictive value of the model is about 97 to 98%. So it's a pretty good screening tool for patients who before, if a physician is concerned that they may have um, um, elevated pressures, getting an electrocardiogram in this instance would be a good way to rule it out. But again, um, the purpose of what I've described here is just designing a big black box to do this. I have not dealt with what I started out to talk about is how will I know if the model will be good for my specific patient. The discriminatory ability of the model is not perfect. The accuracy of the model is not perfect, but when, when will it fail? And so this is where we use domain knowledge to be able to, to, to estimate the, um, or understand when the model will not um, work. So the approach is as follows. We have a new patient. We want to understand what the model's prediction is for that patient and understand whether we should trust the model's prediction for that patient. So we 
put the patient's data, the electrocardiogram into the model and we get an estimate of whether the pressures are elevated or not. One of the things I didn't tell you is that the model not only predicts the pressure, it predicts several other hemodynamic quantities, several other quantities corresponding to some of these concepts that I mentioned previously that, um, that, that are familiar to the clinician. And these are things that the clinician knows. And the, the point being that you can calculate the cardiac pressures of interest from these data. So the model produces predictions of the pressures using two separate, way, two separate ways, as a direct prediction and as a backhanded prediction using other quantities. So if the model using these two predictions, if they disagree, we say the model does not accurately capture the hemodynamics for the patient in question and therefore it is unreliable. So we can build an unreliability score given by whether the model is internally consistent. If the model is internally consistent, then these two numbers will be the same. If it's not, they'll be different. And that's the score UX, measures the, in the internal consistency of the model predictions. And we show that when the unreliability score is high, the model error is higher. This is the error on the y-axis. And this is sort of the top 50% of the, of, um, uh, I'm sorry, the bottom 50% mod, the predictions that you most believe, those that are the most unreliable, and these are the top 10% of unreliability um, predictions, the most unreliable predictions. And if you also look at this in the AUC, I'm just gonna focus here, the top 10% of unreliable predictions, the most unreliable predictions have an AUC a little above 0 0.5. Again, 0 0.5 is the worst, worst one. And we've done this in, in, um, different, um, uh, in different cohorts, heart failure and transplant. So I am just going to skip to just this last um, statement in terms of where we, where we see this work going. So in, if you go into the hospital and go into an intensive care unit, patients are highly instrumented. There's lots of data that we can acquire from the patients over time, and they have lots of invasive monitoring. In, on the wards and even at home, there's not this level of, of, of monitoring. What we would like to do is to, um, get the same level of detail for patients who are outside of the hospital, outside of the intensive care unit in regular hospital wards, and even at home using low lying fruit, using deep and deep network models, at least, and it has been useful, but it's not the, certainly not the only way, the way that one can leverage to do this um, um, and um, to get insights into different disease processes. I had one application, but I'll skip that. And I will just go to my summary. Methods that infer failure modes of complex models help to ensure the right models apply to the right patient. And complex models should strive to rationalize their predictions using concepts that are familiar to the intended user. And of course, I have to talk about the people who do the work. Um, this is most of the group. I, this, this slide is not all, all inclusive. Daphne Schlesinger is a talented PhD student. Um, in my uh, research group did a lot of the um, bladder work uh, and the trustworthy work. I should talk, um, I should say Anurud Raghu is also another brilliant student in my, in, in the, in the group. And he did a lot of the work on the uh, knowledge guided networks and learning to predict the support. And this is just the other people, not clinical coordinator at MGH and some of our collaborators on the MGH side. Okay, I think I am done. Thank you so much, Colin. That was uh, inspirational. And I already have myself a number of questions because the first thing that came to my mind is like, I do conversations with the Apple team or something because these guys, they use uh, some machine learning on their on the watch, but I don't think uh, we're getting there because basically if I understood correctly, you're able to, you know, like to infer from the ECG signals uh, unrelated uh, data, I would say, but well, it's all connected, but th there's so much that is impossible for us to see, right? And then the second one would be like, and how you build trust on this, which I think you have a technical solution for this, but eventually you also have a patient that you need to, I guess, convince, or if you could elaborate, at least for me, that would be so helpful. Yeah, ab absolutely. So with, with respect to the uh, collaborations with, um, with companies that actually garner um, ECG data from, from, um, from devices, so we have one collaboration with a company that designs a patch um, to do this. And um, we are, uh, so in a lot of, so that's one, one application. The other 
is we are generalizing these results to precisely the type of information that comes from the Apple Watch and others. Right now, this method is based on the 12 lead electrocardiogram. So that's, whereas a watch gives you a single lead. And, and so the, the first step is generalizing the approach from the multi-lead data to a single lead data. And I think that's when we're, we are we're poised to go forward. But we do have a prospective trial that is ongoing now with a, with a patch device that uses a single lead for tasks like this estimating elevated pressures. So the, the, the trustworthiness is a, is, a, is a great question. Trustworthiness is more for whether the clinician will use the information or not. And, and so whether, how the clinician explains it to the patient and the, how they rationalize the fact that they're using it has to deal with these concepts these fundamental concepts that they understand. So the, so the colloquy that they have with the patient has to be something that the clinician understands and clinicians are trained to be able to explain these physiologic concepts to patients. That's part of the training. So, so I think the explanation part of this is once the clinician believes that the, that the algorithm is appropriate or he's gonna lead, yield a trustworthy result to the patient, then that second step can happen using concepts that they're familiar with. So the trustworthy aspect we dealt with the first part of that. Does a clinician understand or believe or have data to believe that this model will not fail for a particular patient? And then from that point, the discourse, discourse can happen. I hope, that, I hope that's clear. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin, again, for a fantastic talk. Oh, so there's a question in the chat. Have you observed any increased robustness to data shift? Yes, when using your approach that more is probably some knowledge. Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. So there's always, uh, that is a great question. Uh, thank you, Emily. So right, so, um, so data shift is a problem and data shift in, in these, in these um, instances are what plagues them being applicable across different do domains. And we have, um, what our approach here, and the only way to know is just to test it. So we apply this on mass general data. We have data from another hospital that we are um, applying this to. We are get uh, in the process of gathering data from Hopkins, which is another hospital, and starting up trials outside the country in Taiwan. So it's so I, I can only say at this point to stay tuned. But that is a it's a great question because that is an impediment to the general application of these of these methods. And I think Pete is raising the hand and then we have Peter. a clicking also asking a question on the chat. Pete, Good to see you, Peter. Go? I think you're muted. Yeah, that's the most common statement on Zoom. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Colin, that was fascinating. Um, so I, one of my good friends used to be an intelligence analyst at the CIA. And I remember his favorite expression was, beware of single factor explanations. Um, and what, so I think the most profound question that you raised was close to the beginning of your talk where you were talking about what is an explanation. And you basically gave an answer, which is an explanation is if I can do some kind of linear model uh, like a logistic regression. No, then, then that was the, not my answer. Then the betas, the betas um, uh, are, are the explanation of how these different features interact or, or add up in order to reach- No, no, so, no just, just a part of clarification. My, my statement about the, I was trying to contrast complex models to simple models and how simple models fit in the framework of how one understands um, the clinical process because it's typically based, many of them are, are founded in features that one believes to be um, causally related to the outcome. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's the statement. But what is an explanation is a different statement. What, what, what is an, my, my statement about what is an explanation is I don't know. It's hard to define what an explanation is, but I know what a bad explanation is. And I think that was, that was, my, that was my premise. And a bad explanation happens when the explainer and the listener speak different languages. So a necessary condition. I, I, I buy that and, and I accept that argument, but it seems to me that um, I'm still 
nervous about what a good explanation is. I, I think we can both agree that there are tons of bad ways to explain stuff. But if you look in, in, in this literature, most of the uh, attempts that people make to give explanations uh, are based on some sort of, of feature weight or um, something like that. And they don't take into account the combinations. They typically use some sort of essentially additive model um, that says, well, this contributed to the decision and this other thing contributed a little more to the decision. Um, but the world is nonlinear. Uh, there, there are feedback effects and so on. And so I'm just wondering, um, how do you actually give a good explanation in, and in addition to just recognizing bad ones? So I think it's hard to define what a good explanation is, but I think everybody knows when they've heard one. So if somebody's trying to explain something to you, um, whether it be in a course or, or about uh, some other concept that is initially alien to them, it registers when it, when it touches on concepts that they're familiar with. And this is the history of analogy, right? You know, explain things by analogy because you want to find simple ways that people are familiar with in order to, it, it, to be, and that's, that's how they understand. And they'll go, oh, I got it. So my, my statement is, I all, notwithstanding what you said, everything you said is true. The point is the explanation has to, in some way, to be a good explanation, and this is a necessary condition, has to, has to complement concepts that are familiar to the listener. You cannot explain something. It's, it's extraordinarily hard, and I would dare say it's not possible to do so, if you cannot if you cannot reduce it by analogy or some other way to things that somebody is familiar with. And so the linear effects and nonlinear effects, all of that is true, but it's a little aside from my point. And my point is that to begin the discourse, to begin the colloquy of, of an explanation, you have to understand those concepts that are familiar to the user, or to the person you hope to explain it to. I think, uh, yeah, I think oh, sorry, Peter, was that, was that good or was that any? Uh, well, it, it's, it's half good. Uh, <laughs> well, we can, we can, we can I, take it, we can, I, we can take I, it offline. I agree with your characterization completely, but it doesn't, it doesn't answer to me the question of how to make a good explanation. Right, because, th because that is not something that I have in this talk, at least, because a lot of that is a philosophical question. And more importantly, it is context dependent, mm -hmm. right? So, so, I, so I think the, the general question of what makes a good explanation, I think is a kind of a straw man. It doesn't make any sense. The question doesn't make any sense. You, you, it, it's always within the context of an explainer and a listener. And then you can, have a, you can have a thoughtful discussion about what an explanation is in that context. But general statements about what makes an explanation, are, are, I don't think are meaningful, meaningful discussions. And I'll get off my soapbox in a minute. But, but, the, but the last thing I'll say before I, put, before I put it away is that when you write papers into, in, in this sphere, it, it, to computer science co conferences, there is this desire to take many different data sets from different regimes and demonstrate that your ability to explain is useful in, in these different settings. And I think that is a fool's errand, in, in, frankly. Because you end up with something that is on an average good, but it's never going to be good for any of the people in each of in each of the regime, regimes individually. I think that is a. I think you have to begin by specifying the, the the people you wish to explain it to. That is my view. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Always good to talk. I think Ha was raising his hand as well, and then Otsekin has also a question on uh, in the chat. Hi, Pauline. That was that was a great talk. Um, uh, as a full disclaimer, I'm a um, HST uh, alumni. Right now, I work uh, for a company called the Caption Health. I'm the chief architect leading the innovation office. Um, your talk was very, very relevant because we face the exact same problem here every time we work for we make some you know AI guided echocardiography you know guidance system and also ejection fraction. Um, estimation system um, from echocardiogram, um, 
you know, um, hard ultrasound images. So this is a very, very, um, you know, relevant question for us as well. Um, so having said that, I have two questions for you, one um, technical question and one more general question. So the technical question, so um, in your pr uh, pressure estimation algorithm, you basically presented two different methods, direct calculation and, you know, back, you know, calculation method. Um, in my opinion, it would be more explainable if you actually use the back calculation method to, uh, to compute the pressure. Um, and I was kind of wondering whether you have considered like, you know, um, that methodology and kind of, you know, bring new patients and you try to predict the delta and that prediction can actually become a, uh, you know, the error estimate that mm -hmm. try to come up with by comparing the direct calculation versus the, the, the back calculation. So that was my first question. The second question is that, well, so I kind of dare to say that I, 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 so I got training from the HST program. So I have both, you know, fits one feed in the clinical, another feed in the, the, uh, the basic. It just keeps hard to get into. Congratulations. <laughs> you, you must be very, 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 very talented. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, please. No problem. Thanks. Sorry, um, we are running a little bit out of time and I see more hands. So hi, right, I'll shut up. So, so I, 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 will, I will be quick. So, I, I kind of audacious to say that the, the standard, we can do much better than standard of care. So for example, in clinical algorithms, for the, the true meaning of clinical algorithms, the parameters are pretty simple. And I kind of want to say that um, clinicians can come up with more kind of clinical parameters and make the standard of care better. And for example, if we kind of confine ourselves, um, explainable models in existing, I mean, emphasis on existing, existing clinical parameters, um, they may be a little bit um, limiting. And I think that it would be a little bit better if the explainable models can actually search for new clinical parameters that will be make sense to the clinical, uh, clinical community. So yeah, I would like to get your perspectives on that as well. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Ha. These are great comments. In the interest of time, I'll try to be, try to be brief. The back calculation is interesting because it does have this explainable component. When the two when the two agree, then we can use those data to rationalize the prediction to the um, to to the to the healthcare provider. Error estimates, very very interesting active area of of of, of uh, at least my my thinking. The the, the explainable model is very so. One of the latest things that we're working on that I, I I did not talk about is combining mechanistic models of of human disease with machine learning. And you can think about the machine learning is estimating the things that you don't have physical insight to, and then they go as input to the uh, to the explainable model. So the search for parameters is in this paradigm. Search for parameters into mechanistic models that have that that have clear clinical insight. Happy wonderful. to talk more offline. Thank you. That's wonderful. I see Randy. Randy. Okay, I, I will be brief also, and uh, mostly I'm gonna agree with what you said to Peter, by the way, um, to put it, I think in even simpler terms, to explain, explaining is a form of communication. Communication requires a shared vocabulary. It's just that simple. And if you can't, if you don't even have a shared vocabulary, you're, you're talking past one another, absolutely. Um, this also reminds me of um, work going back to the early days of computer-aided teaching, um, computer tutors, when the observation was made that the best way to teach somebody is to connect to what they already know, which means you have to know what they already know, at least have a, a model of it, in order to bring them along from there and that's very much in the spirit of what you were saying about explanations having to be con in the context, the context, context of a particular listener, their question, and the explainer. So I just wanted to say I agree with that and reinfor reinforce it. And that wasn't a plant. That's a great way to end this. I think that's that's a that's a great thank you so much, Randy. I think that's a great way to end this end this discussion. And thank you very much all for attending today. We got one minute extra, but it's fantastic. I uh, appreciate your time all uh, and for the great comments and for the fantastic talk today, Colin. Thank you very much again. Have all thank you time. so much for having me. Excellent. Take care. See you very, very soon next week. Bye. Bye-bye now. Thank you, Pete. Thank you all.